Hello, and welcome to the 2023 Supervisory Priorities Webinar. I'm Christelle Oriusetti, a Policy Officer in the Office of Examination and Insurance, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we begin, I will cover some technical tips to make sure that you can see the webinar console and hear the presenters. First, all attendees will be in listen-only mode. Second, if you have questions, you can submit them at any time using the Q&A located at the bottom right of your WebEx console. To submit a question, simply click the Q&A button, type your question in the box provided, and then click send. Third, if your volume sounds too low, check to make sure your volume is turned all the way up on your computer. If that doesn't work, you may have to plug in external speakers. Fourth, closed captions will be available within the WebEx console. To enable captions, click CC in the bottom left of the console. Over the next hour, we'll discuss the NCUA Letter to Credit Unions 23 CU01 Supervisory Priorities in greater detail, explain the purpose of each priority, and discuss what you can expect on your upcoming examination. To help me today with the webinar, we have an all-star cast from NCUA program offices who will also be available to address the questions submitted throughout the webinar. The offices listed will cover changes in the exam program, which will include the Office of Examinations and Insurance, or ENI, Capital Markets Division. They'll cover interest rate and liquidity risks. Credit risk updates will be discussed by ENI's Credit Market Division. Fraud prevention and detection and updates on the current expected credit losses or CECL implementation will be discussed by ENI's Chief Accounting Division. Information security is presented by ENI's Critical Infrastructure Division. Updates to the 2023 Consumer Compliance Review will be discussed by the Office of Consumer and Financial Protection. And other examination updates, including succession planning, small credit union and minority deposit institution support, or MDI, and the post-examination survey will be brought to you by ENI's Policy Division and the Office of the Executive Director. We will leave time at the end of the presentation to answer questions from the audience. Please add your questions to the Q&A as you think of them. I want to now welcome the Office of Examination and Insurance Director, Kelly Lay, who's going to start us off with some opening remarks. Kelly, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Christelle. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 Supervisory Priorities Webinar. It's great to be here with you today. Annually, the NSUA Board analyzes and monitors risk in the financial industry to determine the priorities for the NCUA exam program. Today, we will discuss the agency's priorities for exam staff and other updates outlined in NSUA Letter to Credit Unions 23CU01. NSUA's vision is strengthen communities and protect consumers by ensuring equitable financial inclusion through a robust, safe, sound, and evolving credit union system. This vision is reflected in this year's letter as we continue as an agency to monitor risk and empower credit unions. Liquidity risk and interest rate risk are the two main concerns for 2023. First, market risk exposure to earnings and capital has increased due to the more than 425 basis point increase in market rates in 2022. This happens because the assets and liabilities of a credit union are not repriced equally or simultaneously. Credit risk is another top priority in supervision. Credit unions experienced high loan growth during the pandemic, including modifications, loan participations, and eligible obligation purchases, in part from the temporary regulatory release offered, which ended last year. Another top priority is fraud detection and prevention. In 2023, the NCUA is implementing a new management questionnaire, which is intended to improve the detection of insider fraud and identify warning signs or other potential new risks. Cyber threats continue to develop and target financial institutions, so cybersecurity remains a supervisory priority. NSUA is launching the Information Security Examination, or ICE for short, program in 2023 as a tool to monitor cyber threats. Consumer financial protection is still a top priority as well. Today, we will cover the focus areas for 2023 consumer compliance reviews, which include overdraft policies and practices, fair lending, appraisal bias, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
Also, to help credit unions prepare th for their upcoming exam, we've included noteworthy exam program updates in the letter that we also plan to cover today. These updates include the CECL implementation, the small credit union and MDI support programs, and the post-examination survey. As a financial regulator, the NCUA continues to assess the changing economic landscape, regulatory changes, and staff input to ensure our examination program is directed at the biggest threats to the credit union industry, all while working to protect the share insurance fund. Before I turn it back to Christelle, I'd like to thank the staff in the various divisions of the Office of Examination and Insurance and the staff in the Office of Consumer Financial Protection for their collaboration and cooperation on this webinar. Thank you to each of you listening today as well. Back to you, Crystal. Thank you for that welcome and overview, Kelly. Now we will cover the supervisory priorities. Starting us off today is Senior Capital Markets Specialist Brian Heitman from the Capital Markets Division of ENI to discuss interest rate and liquidity risk. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Heitman. Um, from the Division of Capital Markets. Interest rate risk or IRR remains an NCUA supervisory priority for 2023. Given much higher interest rates, examiners will be focused on increasing interest rate risk and the related exposure to earnings, liquidity, and capital. In September 2022, the NCUA issued letter to credit unions 22CU9 and supervisory letter 2201 both of which update the NCUA supervisory framework for IRR. Just as a reminder, as indicated in the supervisory letter, the NEV supervisory test serves as a scoping tool for examiners to determine the depth of steps to be taken. More information on this can be found in the September 2022 letters. We are also approaching the one year anniversary of the addition of S in CAMELS for sensitivity to market risk which formalizes the focus on interest rate risk in the CAMELS rating process. This separates IRR from liquidity risk, which is now a standalone rating in the L component. High levels of IRR can increase your credit union's liquidity risks, contribute to asset quality deterioration and capital erosion, and put pressure on earnings. Well-managed credit unions are prudent and proactive in managing IRR and the related risks, risks to capital, asset quality, earnings, and liquidity. As such, examiners will review your credit union's IRR program for the following key risk management and control activities. One, key assumptions and related data sets are reasonable and well-documented. Two, the credit union's overall level of IRR exposure is properly measured and controlled. Three, results are promptly communicated to decision makers and the board of directors. Four, proactive action is taken to remain within safe and sound policy limits. Additional references for IRR are in the examiner's guide under work papers and resources. I will now move to the next supervisory priority, liquidity risk. Closely related to IRR volatility is the impact on liquidity. Higher interest rates have caused a slowdown in prepayments for some loans and investment holdings which has resulted in reduced cash flows. Large increases in share balances from 2020 to 2022 may result in an increased level of share sensitivity and share roll-off as market rates continue to rise. In evaluating the L component of the CAMELS rating to determine the adequacy of your credit union's liquidity risk management framework, examiners will consider the current and prospective sources of liquidity compared to funding needs. Examiners will review your credit union's liquidity policies, procedures, and risk limits. Examiners will also evaluate the adequacy of your credit union's liquidity risk management, excuse me, liquidity risk management framework relative to the size, complexity, and risk profile of your credit union. Subject to applicable asset thresholds, examiners will assess liquidity management by one, reviewing the potential effects of changing interest rates on the market value of assets and the credit union's borrowing capacity. Two, looking for scenario analysis for liquidity risk modeling, including possible member share migrations, for example, shifts from core deposits into more rate sensitive accounts. Three, analyzing the scenario analysis for changes in cash flow projections for an appropriate range of relevant factors, for example, changing prepayment speeds. And four, 
confirming the appropriateness of contingency funding plans to address any plausible unexpected liquidity shortfalls. In small credit unions under $50 million in assets, the liquidity review is limited to your credit union's liquidity policy to ensure it provides a board approved framework for managing liquidity and a list of contingent liquidity sources that can be employed under adverse circumstances as required in NC regulations section 741.12. Resources and guidance on liquidity risk can be found in the NCUA's examiner's guide. Thank you, and I will now hand it back over to Christelle. Thank you. Next, I will turn it over to Senior Credit Specialist Jessica Yam, who will be presenting for the Credit Markets Division to discuss credit risk updates. Thank you, Christelle. The 2023 Credit Risk Advisory Priority incorporates elements from ongoing priorities and reviews of the credit union within lending portfolios and incorporates new elements in addressing the changing economic environment. Specifically, NCUA examiners should continue to review credit unions' credit risk management and the mitigation efforts for all lending programs and then assess if credit unions' risk management practice are commensurate with the level of the complexity and nature of their lending activities. The current economic environment is characterized by high inflation and borrowing costs, caused by rising interest rate, both of which can negatively impact borrowers' ability to repay outstanding debt. Rising interest rate can also lead to increased payment shocks for borrowers with adjustable rates and interest-only mortgages, as well as increasing the cost of variable rate borrowings and the newly originated loans. Additionally, the potential for economic downturn or hard lending may result in less job stability for existing borrowers and increased unemployment. Credit unions should have a credit risk review system in place that were updated in response to the changing economic environment to promptly identify loans with credit weaknesses to take timely actions to mitigate potential losses. NCUA examination staff will incorporate relevant procedures associated with agencies' supervisory priorities in response to the changing economic environment. In addition, NCUA examiners will also review the soundness of existing lending programs and adjustments that credit union made to loan underwriting standards, portfolio monitoring practices, and loan workout strategies for borrower facing financial hardship. Additionally, examiners will review the adequacy of a credit union's reserve for loan losses. NCUA examiners will carefully consider all factors in evaluating credit union's effort to provide relief for borrowers, including whether the efforts were reasonable and conducted with proper controls and management oversight. Back to you, Christelle. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Fraud and Risk Analyst Specialist, Janelle Porter, presenting from the Chief Accounting Division to discuss fraud prevention and detection. Thank you, Christelle. The management questionnaire was developed to help identify insider fraud risks potential material supervisory concerns, red flags, or other issues earlier in the examination process. This helps protect credit unions and reduce potential losses to the share insurance fund. The questionnaire can also increase the NCUA's offsite work capabilities and assist examiners in conducting more efficient examinations. Beginning on January 1st of this year, examiners began sending the management questionnaire along with the items needed list. Credit unions can expect to receive the questionnaire at least four weeks before the exam begins, at the same time as their items needed list. An email announcing the implementation of the management questionnaire was sent to credit unions from the Office of Examination and Insurance on December 20, 2022. The NCUA developed this questionnaire after reviewing similar questionnaires used by other federal and state regulators. We also conducted a pilot of the questionnaire in 2021 and used its feedback to refine our questions and focus on the most significant risks while minimizing burden to credit unions. There are two sections in this questionnaire. The first is the anti-fraud program section, which is primarily for the credit union to assess its own anti-fraud program and policies, and could also be used to generate discussions during the exam. The second section is called the Board of Directors, Management, and Business Associates. 
This is where questions are asked that can lead to material supervisory concerns, such as insider abuse, fraud red flags, conflicts of interest or nepotism, or other concerns. There are two versions of the questionnaire, one for risk-focused exams and one for the small credit union examination program. The questions are similar, but the SCUP version is refined to address issues that are more applicable to small credit unions. Examiners will review the responses to the questionnaire with a focus on the items mentioned previously, material supervisory concerns, fraud or conflict of interest red flags, insider fraud risks, or other matters. By reviewing the responses in advance of the exam, examiners can update the exam scope as appropriate. Credit unions using the Modernized Examination and Risk Identif Identification Tool, or MERIT, can receive the questionnaire and respond directly through MERIT survey function. Examiners will provide electronic copies of the questionnaire to credit unions that do not currently use MERIT, and credit unions will return it directly to their examiner. Because responses may include sensitive information, we recommend using a secure method to return the electronic version of the questionnaire to the examiner. Credit unions that complete the questionnaire through merit survey function do not need to take any additional precautions due to the security and privacy protections built into merit. The questionnaire will be used in all full scope exams the NCUA participates in. Credit unions are only required to complete one similar questionnaire per examination. If a state supervisory agency uses a similar questionnaire, the federal and state examiners will coordinate to decide which questionnaire the credit union will complete. Your examiner will select the due date for the questionnaire, which will typically be before the exam begins. This will allow the examiner to review the responses, follow up with any questions, and make any refinements to the exam scope, which will increase overall exam efficiencies. The NCUA encourages credit unions to complete the questionnaire to the best of your knowledge. If your credit union needs to make any changes to answers or if any information changes before the examination is completed, please contact your examiner. Examiners can reissue the questionnaire in merit or receive supplemental electronic versions if needed. This concludes my remarks. Thank you, Janelle. I'll now ask Ernie Chambers to address information security risk. Ernie is the Director of Critical Infrastructure. Ernie, the floor is yours. Thanks, Christelle. Cybersecurity risk remain a significant, persistent, and ever-evolving threat to the financial system. Credit union technology-related operating environments are increasing in complexity. Credit unions can protect themselves with a cybersecurity program that evolves and adapts to the changing threat environment. We encourage credit unions to remain vigilant and continue to adapt their ability to respond to evolving cybersecurity threats. The NCUA will be implementing the new Information Security Examination, or ICE, which revises its information technology examination scope and procedures to improve efficiency and effectiveness. Examiners will use the ICE to identify and address regulatory and cybersecurity risks with examinations starting in 2023. The NCUA's Automated Cybersecurity Evaluation Toolbox, or the Toolbox, which provides credit unions the capability to conduct a maturity assessment, is aligned with the FFIEC, that's the Federal Financial Institutions Examination Council Cybersecurity Assessment Tool, or the CAT. Using the assessment within the toolbox, allows institutions of all sizes to determine and measure their cybersecurity preparedness. The use of the toolbox is entirely voluntary and does not introduce any new requirements or expectations on credit unions. Back to you, Christelle. Thanks. I will turn it over to the Office of Consumer and Financial Protections, Ernestine Ward. Director of the Division of Consumer Compliance Policy to discuss consumer financial protection updates. 
Great. Thank you, Christelle. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Christelle mentioned, um, my name is Ernestine Ward, and I'm from the Office of Consumer Financial Protection. And today I'm going to speak on the 2023 Consumer Financial Protection Supervisory Priorities. So just for some background con um, context, NCUA examines for compliance with consumer financial protection regulations during every federal credit union exam. We consider several factors when developing the consumer compliance supervisory priorities. These include, but are not limited to, recent rules, findings from safety and soundness and fair lending exams, consumer complaints, and even areas of common interest that are discussed in collaboration with other FFIEC members. So for 2023, the consumer compliance supervisory priorities are overdraft programs, fair lending, and this includes appraisal bias, the Truth in Lending Act, which was implemented by Regulation Z, and this is in the auto lending context only, and then also the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which was implemented by Regulation V. Next, perfect. All right, so overdraft protection programs are important to credit unions and important to the members and the market and regulatory landscape around overdraft fees is always evolving. Um, in 2023, examiners are going to conduct overdraft reviews and federal credit unions with assets totaling 500 million or more as of the end of quarter 3 2022. Examiners are going to review credit unions overdraft programs, including website advertising, balance calculation methods, settlement processes and examiners are also going to review disclosures and member statements and this is going to include statements that are related to PALS 2 loans. Fair lending, um, as we all know, it makes it illegal for a creditor to discriminate against an applicant in any aspect of a credit transaction based on certain protected characteristics. And for our 2023 fair lending reviews, um, examiners are going to assess credit unions policies and practices related to loan pricing discrimination risk and steering discrimination risk. Now, these are both areas of review and in their interagency fair lending examination procedures. Um, in addition, examiners are also going to assess a credit union's policies and practices related to residential real estate appraisals and review a sample of real estate loan files that involve an appraisal. And just as in 2021, uh, fair lending reviews will be conducted in both risk-focused and small credit union exams. Next up is the Truth in Lending Act and its implements regulation, Regulation Z. And basically this requires that borrowers receive written disclosures about important terms of credit. So for 2023, examiners are going to review compliance with the Reg Z auto loan disclosures, and this is going to be for federal credit unions whose loan portfolios have increased more than 30% between September 30th, 2021 and September 30th, 2022. Examiners are also going to review a sample of auto loan files. And lastly, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act and its implements in Regulation, Regulation V, basically promote the accuracy, fairness, and privacy of consumer credit information. So for this year, examiners are going to review credit unions' compliance with Reg V disclosures related to furnishing, adverse action notices, risk-based pricing, and consumer rights disclosures. Um, thank you so much for your time, and back to you, Christelle. Thank you. We will now shift gears to discuss other updates. To help credit unions get ready for their upcoming exam, we've included additional exam program improvements in the letter. We will now cover the post-examination survey, small credit union and MDI support programs, and the current expected credit losses implementation. I'll now turn it over to our acting chief accountant, Chris McGrath, to discuss CECL. This is Chris McGrath, Acting Chief Accountant from the Office of Examination and Insurance. CECL was finally here for credit unions. Most credit unions adopted CECL as of January 1st, 2023. We have received many questions on the CECL accounting standard and the simplified CECL toll. Thus, we have added new FAQs to the CECL resources webpage and the simplified CECL toll webpage. Please go to ncoa.gov and search on CECL to find them. The FAQs provide guidance on implementation, the day, one adjust, the day one adjustment, as well as using the tool by large credit unions. 
in June 2021, the board acted to pass the final rule on the transition to the current expected credit loss methodology. The CECL transition rule gives an exception to applying CECL to credit unions with less with assets of less than 10 million. Of course, state chartered credit unions need to check their state requirements as some states require GAAP compliance. For those el eligible credit unions with assets of less than 10 million, the rule states any reasonable reserve methodology incurred loss provided it adequately covers known and probable loan losses. And the incurred loss methodology is the former gap for loss contingencies and loan impairments. Finally, if a credit union with less than 10 million in assets decides to adopt CECL, they get the benefit of the three year transition phase in, even if gap compliance is not required by their state. Examiners will approach CECL very similar to the approach used for the former allowance for loan and lease losses, or AL. Like the AL, the allowance for credit losses is an estimate. Estimates are just that, they are inexact. And the steps that we performed previously to assess the AL will be very much the same steps that we will do for the allowance for credit losses. At the core is the full and fair disclosure. Our regulation, section 702.113, requires credit unions to maintain a, an AL in accordance with GAAP. In checking with our general counsel, where the regulation uses the term AL, the intent, the intent also applies to the allowance for credit losses on loans and leases. Full and fair disclosure demands that a credit union properly address charges for loan losses as follows. One, charges for loan and lease losses shall be made timely and in accordance with GAAP, which is now CECL. Two, the allowance must be maintained in accordance with GAAP. And three, at a minimum, adjustments to the allowance shall be made prior to distribution or posting of any dividend to the accounts of members. The examination steps will be very similar to our prior examination steps regarding the allowance. Starting with reviewing the credit union's policies. Examiners will, will evaluate the allowance for credit loss policies and procedures, and they will assess the loss estimation method used to arrive at the overall estimate for the allowance for credit losses. This includes documentation, supporting the reasonableness of management's assumptions, validation, evaluations, and just judgments. Additionally, examination activities may include evaluating whether management has appropriately considered historical loss information, current conditions, and reasonable and supportable forecasts, including significant qualitative factors that affect the collectability of loans. Assessing loss estimation techniques, including the loss estimation model, if applicable, as well as the incorporation of qualitative adjustments to determine whether the resulting estimates of the expected credit losses are in conformity, in conformity with GAAP. Evaluating the adequacy of documentation and the effectiveness of controls used to support the measurement of the allowance for credit losses. For adherence to GAAP, there are some important changes over the old incurred loss allowance method. Losses are estimated. The concept of probable is gone. There is no more of that 70% likelihood, but rather a lower threshold of an estimate. It is management's estimate of expected credit losses. An entity's estimate of expected credit losses shall include a measure of expected risk of credit loss, even if that risk is remote, regardless of the method applied to estimate credit losses. The one exception is where expected non-payment is zero, like with government securities such as treasuries or debt from government-sponsored enterprises. Also, CISO looks into the future. CISO looks at past events, historical losses, and current conditions. 
plus reasonable and supportable forecasts. A look, a look forward period is added with the reasonable and supportable forecast. Whether the model is internally or externally generated, a credit union should have a process in place to validate and ensure data integrity. To be clear, there is no requirement for a credit union to perform a third party validation. However, a credit union should still reconcile the account and ensure the accuracy of the figures being used. And we will take a look at the results of any independent review. Now to the day one adjustment. Upon the adoption of CECL, the accounting standard requires that the change from the old allowance value to the new one is recorded into undivided earnings, whether it is an increase or a decrease. The adjustment to undivided earnings includes the change due to the allowance for credit losses on loans and leases, the allowance for credit losses on investments, and the allowance for credit losses on off balance sheet credit exposures. With CECL requiring the estimation of losses over the life of all loans, the allowance for credit losses is expected to increase, lowering the credit union's net worth ratio. The CECL transition rule allows for this increase in the allowance caused by CECL to be amortized into the net worth ratio over three years, thus allowing credit unions time to adjust and less worries about prompt corrective action. Changes are being made to the call report to allow a credit union to enter their day one adjustment as well as the date of adoption. With this data, the net worth ratio for prompt corrective action will be automatically calculated with the applicable amortization adjustment. Finally, CISO allows many models to be used to estimate credit losses. It is up to the credit union to find their best, to find their best approach. Back to you, Christelle. Thank you. Natasha McAdoo is NCUA's Access Coordinator. Access stands for Advancing Communities Through Credit, Education, Stability, and Support which is an initiative to foster financial inclusion and address the financial disparities experienced by minority, underserved, and unbanked populations. Natasha will now discuss support for small and minority depository credit unions. Thank you, Christelle, and thank you all for joining today. The NCUA recognizes the important role that small and minority depository institutions play in the credit union system and in the day-to-day -day lives of the communities they serve across the country. The NCUA is committed to supporting the ongoing successes of these credit unions, including acknowledging that at times, some of these credit unions may need more or different support from the NCUA than other credit unions. So, in 2023, the NCUA will continue the important small credit union and MDI support program which the agency implemented in 2022 to support and preserve these institutions. For 2023, the agency offers enhanced and additional support by allocating additional staff hours and resources to elected MDI credit unions, regardless of their asset size, and elected credit unions under 100 million in assets. With this, examiners can offer assistance that is not part of the typical exam process, such as resources and guidance on creating succession plans, strategic plans, and help with exam and compliance issues. Also, NCUA examiners will tailor their approach to MDI examinations with the use of support materials designed to offer examiners additional guidance and insight on the unique strategies and needs of MDI credit unions. Since many MDI credit unions have unique business models, examiners can also utilize MDI peer metrics as opposed to traditional peer metrics. In 2023, the NCUA will continue to increase awareness and support of the unique needs of small credit unions and MDIs and their role in serving underserved communities. The NCUA's Access Initiative, Advancing Communities Through Credit, Education, Stability, and Support, 
is one of the ways the NCUA commits to doing this. The Access Initiative seeks to foster financial inclusion and address the financial disparities experienced by the minority, underserved, and unbanked populations. This year, Access will actively engage credit union industry leaders and stakeholders to identify additional ways to help new, small, low-income designated and MDI credit unions grow and prosper. The NCUA also supports small and MDI credit unions by offering free training for credit union staff and board members through platforms such as webinars, roundtables, and the learning management system. The Community Development Revolving Loan Fund Grant and Loan Program provides funds to low-income credit unions so they may extend services to their members and improve credit union operations. And support through mentoring grants to help low-income and small MDI credit unions establish supportive relationships with more experienced credit unions to provide expertise and guidance in serving low-income and underserved populations. Thanks, Natasha. I will close out this presentation to discuss our last two topics, secession planning and the post-examination survey. Secession planning is something most people don't consider until it's needed. Secession planning can be a simple and enjoyable process, not a drama-filled episode like HBO secession. The credit union system continues to experience consolidation. And the NCUA has found that inadequate secession planning is often a reason for credit union consolidations, especially in smaller credit unions. A credit union without an orderly plan for secession may experience disruptions in member services, or in the most extreme case, the credit union having to merge in order to survive due to key personnel leaving the credit union. So is your credit union ready? According to the Society for Human Resource Management, 4.3 million U.S. workers quit their jobs in December 2021, based on data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. From January through November 2021, 1,231 CEOs left their post, an increase of 1.1% 1 .1 over the 1,218 CEOs who did so through the same period in 2020, according to Chicago-based outplacement firm Challenger, Gray, and Christmas. Secession planning is a process that is used to identify and develop potential successors for key roles. A secession plan is a document that outlines the steps that will be taken to ensure the critical positions within an organization are filled with qualified candidates if the incumbent leaves the organization. A secession plan supports continuity if the CEO or another key manager can no longer carry out the duties assigned. By defining a secession plan, a credit union establishes a process for handling management turnover to continue running smoothly and without interruption. A strong secession plan will establish concrete steps the credit union will take when the secession plan is activated. A secession plan will be board approved and reviewed periodically. However, an evaluation of the secession plan should be considered whenever there's a significant change at the credit union, such as a change in key personnel, a new initiative, or new risk emerging, for example, a change in your field of membership or a sponsor strike. Having these systems in place ensures there is accountability for key decisions and strategies. Each credit union is different. Larger credit unions with several executive level positions will need a more robust plan. A small credit union still needs a plan, but may only have one or two key positions, and they may already know they need to look externally for a candidate. While the complexity of a secession plan should match the credit union size and sophistication, all secession plans should address backfilling the CEO, other members of the executive team, and director. There are resources available to credit unions to help prepare. Letters to Credit Unions 22 CU05 CAMELS Rating System identifies secession planning for key management positions as one of the other key factors considered when assessing the management of a credit union. In addition, NCUA's Learning Management System, or LMS, has a succession planning module that credit union officials can use to help them either start the process or refine the one they already have. The NCUA's LMS for credit union has over 40 courses available for credit union officials covering various topics.
And as always, your assigned district examiner can help you prepare as well. This year, you can expect examiners to request information about your credit union's approach to secession planning for senior leaders, including any written secession plan the credit union has established. We want to emphasize, however, that examiners will not issue an examiner's finding or a document of resolution if the credit union has not conducted secession planning or the planning is not adequate unless the credit union violates its policy for conducting secession planning or administering such plans. One of NCUA's five values is transparency, being open, direct, and frequent in communication. One way NCUA worked to put this value into practice was by implementing the post-examination survey. In September 2021, NCUA began a new post-examination survey pilot allowing the credit union to provide timely feedback to the agency. The post-examination survey pilot was an optional voluntary survey sent to credit unions after their examination. The NCUA Ombudsman's Office administered this program to maintain the separation of survey responses from NCUA staff conducting the examination. The pilot was used to help introduce the post-exam survey process to credit unions and provide NCUA with insight into a future survey process managed by a third party. While the pilot program continues, NCUA is working with a third party vendor to begin managing the survey process in 2023. To help inform the future survey process and survey questions, NCUA worked with two focus groups, one internal group of field staff and supervisors, and one external group of senior credit union staff. In addition, all regions and office were provided the opportunity to provide input and feedback for the future su survey process and survey questions. For example, one of the pilot survey questions asked credit units to provide input regarding what questions NCUA should ask in the future survey process. This input was also included in the future survey process and questions. The agency is on target to implement the future survey process in 2023. Under the post-exam exam survey pilot, federal credit unions are currently receiving a survey at the conclusion of a regular exam. In the future, management can expect the survey, but with some updates. NCUA has con contracted with a third party to manage the future survey process, including sending the survey, receiving the survey responses, and providing NCUA with survey results. The survey will be sent to the credit union, CEO, or manager, as reported on the credit union profile. This is the same as with the current pilot. The survey will be sent within two weeks of completion of the exam by the NCUA examiner in charge. And this is also the same as the current pilot. NCUA is still working through the details of the survey process with third party vendor. And the NCUA Ombudsman's Office is currently gathering summary pilot survey data for 2022. And now policy officer Elliot Weiss will guide us through the Q&A session and to help us with responses. And it looks like we have a few coming in already. Elliot, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Christelle. The first question we have is for John Myers of the Critical Infrastructure Division. John, is a copy of the information system exam tool available for download and review? Thank you, Elliot. Um, the toolbox is an application internal to NCUA. We made the application available to state supervisory authorities as well. Um, however, we did notify the credit unions of the new um, information security examination. Within that notification to credit unions, we did attach all the exam level statements for each type of examination. So although credit unions cannot download the application itself, we did provide them the, the content from what's inside our tool. Thank you. Thank you, John. The next question is for Janelle Patar from the Chief Accountant's Office. Janelle, when you speak of red flags in the fraud context, are you using that term in a general sense, or is that term being used specifically in the context of identity theft red flag procedures and letter to credit unions 8CU24? Thank you for the question. We're speaking about a more generalized context here. So focusing on insider fraud risks, conflicts of interest, nepotism, and other concerns. Back to you, Elliot. Okay, thank you, Janelle. The next question is from Policy Director Summer Chapman. 
Summer, and this is a pretty popular question, actually. Will there be a transcript of the slides today? Some of the presenters have gone through the slides too fast for us to take notes. Good afternoon, Elliot. This is Summer Chapman, Policy Director on ENI. Yes, we will post a recording of this webinar on NCUA's YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you, Summer. The next question is for Chief Accountant Chris McGrath. Chris, the interagency policy statement on allowance for credit losses, which includes the NCUA, requires institutions to periodically complete an independent model validation. Are you saying that this does not apply for credit unions? Uh, no, I'm not saying that. Uh, to clarify, independent means an internal or external review of the CSO model by someone who was not involved in the in the development of the model or who is involved in the operations of the CSO model. Okay, thanks, Chris. The next question is for Summer Chapman. Summer, can state chartered credit unions expect examiners to work with state regulators to review the consumer protection priorities that appear to have been framed here as only applicable for federal credit unions? Hey, Elliot, NCUA examiners will complete the consumer compliance exam scope activities described in today's webinar in federal credit unions only. Since a state chartered credit unions primary regulator is the state and the, the state will determine the scope of any consumer compliance review, and if the state chartered credit union has a question about what areas will be reviewed in 2023, they should contact their state regulator. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Summer. The next question is for Chief Accountant Chris McGrath. Chris, we've got a Cecil question. It mentions uh, three years to grow into the increased allowance for credit losses amount. Does this mean that the credit, the credit unions are allowed to post the increase to capital and amortize that over up to three years? To clarify, it's, it's something different. Uh, the day one adjustment, which is the increase or decrease caused by CSO, is recorded to undivided earnings. However, going forward, the amortization ha happens outside the general ledger. That is, the amortization will be automatic in the call report. Okay, thank you, Chris. Let's go back to John Myers of the Critical Infrastructure Division. John, regarding the Information Security Examination, or ICE, at what credit union size and scale should we expect the core plus statements to apply? Thank you, Elliot. Um, the core pledge statements were developed by regional and national information systems officers um, to specifically incorporate into examination when they feel a level of risk and complexity warrants it. The core pledge statements are not automatically added to any exam based upon the size. So it really depends on the examiner, the level of risk and complexity of whether or not uh, they add some of those statements or not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Summer, back to you, uh, Policy Director Summer Chapman. Will the presentation slides be provided after the webinar? Hey, Elliot. Yes, we got this question from several individuals. Um, yes, we are going to work with um, our web editor to have the slides posted on our website. So stay tuned. Okay, thank you, Summer. The next question, we'll go back to Janelle Patari of the Chief Accountant's Office. Janelle, what are the two sections of the fraud survey? Thank you for the question. The first section is called the Anti-Fraud Program, and the second section is called the Board of Directors, Management, and Business Associates. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Janelle. The next question is for John Myers. John, where is the automated ICE or information systems security examination toolbox available? 
Thank you, Elliot. It's a great question. The only external entities the ICE tool is available today are state supervisory authorities. It's an, it's an application internal to the agency. If you're a state supervisory authority looking for the toolbox application, we have reached out to all state supervisory authority officials on record and provided them with the details of obtaining and installing the application. Thank you, Elliot. Okay. Thank you, John. And we do have a little bit more time left. Um, we don't have many more questions now. There were a lot that are very similar that we we'd already answered. Um, seeing as I'm not seeing some of the any more questions, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Christelle for to wrap us up. Christelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elliot. So with that question, we have come to the end of our webcast. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. We hope that you found this information helpful. I'd like to join my co-presenters and everyone who assisted in responding to your questions and thanking you all for attending today's presentation. We would like to wish you a safe and healthy 2023.